I'm an historian by training, and I started working on privacy protection in, April, in September 1964 when I was a graduate student at Columbia University and a student of Alan Weston, so I go back a long time. Uh, the first thing I want to do is congratulate Stuart and Merrill on an incredible accomplishment of the last 25 years with privacy laws and business. It's quite remarkable, and they've been part of what has happened in an important way in the last 25 years. The second thing I'd like to do is I'm going to make eight quick points to you that are really just sort of reflections looking back at the history of data protection. I'm quite proud of myself because I always wanted to emulate my French colleagues who would say, j'ai trois points à faire, and then remember all three of them. I've numbered my points, so I will not forget any of them. The first point I want to make to you is that there is a history of privacy protection, a history of data protection. It exists for the last 50 years, and it goes much back much farther in time. So you're really part of a movement for the protection of privacy as a human right. The second point I would like to make is that there have been problems, starting from the 1960s, of dealing with public sector privacy problems. And we had to fight for legislation like the Privacy Act of 1974 in the United States, the Swedish Data Act of 1973, I think it was. All of these issues had to be overcome uh, through effort and uh, ongoing advocacy in the public sector through the media and eventually for the regulation of the private sector. There always have been tough times. So those of you who think that in 2012 data protection is facing insurmountable hurdles need to be reminded of the historical record. The third point I would make is there's always been limited resources in the public sector, the private sector and companies for doing data protection. There's always been a conservative, anti-regulatory um, uh, ideology that says <coughs> we don't need all this stuff, we don't need all these rules and regulations. So it's no big surprise that in 2012, with economic hard times, we're still having those kinds of difficulties. My fourth point is it remains, in my view, with someone with a PhD in American history, a fundamental problem of data protection globally, that there is no systematic US data protection regime with the kind of regulatory authorities that are, exist in every European country. I admire the fact that the Federal Trade Commission is coming to its senses and doing a few things. It's better than nothing, but it's nothing co compared to what the European <laughs> Union has in place for systematically dealing with data protection problems. <clears throat> that means there is always kind of an anti-regulatory, self-regulatory regime that are being advanced uh, by U.S. interests, whatever else they say about wanting to comply with the European rules, etc. Um, an example of a current problem for me is the constant series of health breaches, health privacy breaches that occur in all of our countries. I recently had a cre credit card go wacko on me, and it was uh, somebody was taking money out of my bank, my credit card in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Visa quickly found the problem, voided my card, issued me another one. We need that kind of real-time auditing with ma major systems of electronic health records so that privacy breaches are stopped up front before harm occurs, class, a class action suits occur. If we can do it in banking, I don't know why we can't have, it, have it electronic health records. I don't have time to go on here, but despite really good privacy training and <clears throat> zero tolerance for health privacy breaches, what I find very, very depressing is that despite people working in healthcare, knowing what the rules are, people are still looking at records of, of patients that they have no right to look at. And that's kind of an insurmountable, that's kind of the original sin problem in data protection, if I may call it that. My sixth point is when I was publishing a book called Protecting Privacy in Surveillance Societies in 1989, I really used the surveillance society theme, which Jim Rule also helped originate, as kind of a unifying theme of the book. And all I would say is that was before the internet was even created. Needless to say, with Google and Facebook and everything else that's going on in the national security state, the problem of surveillance societies is still with us. Uh, and the, the, the ongoing plethora of surveillance cameras in the United Kingdom is just symbolic of that kind of thing. I also want to remind you that despite all of the goals of protecting privacy as a human right and the creation and enforcement and resourcing of the data protection regimes in something like 90 countries, we are now really living post 9-11 in a national security state. I had the privilege led by the United States and its allies, which includes the United Kingdom. I had the privilege of meeting James Bamford, the journalist in Washington a couple of weeks ago, 
And I, any of you who wonder what the national security state is all about should Google, Google James Bamford, B-A-M-F-O-R-D, his recent article in Wired on the kind of incredible national surveillance facility that the U.S. government is building inside mountains and everything else in Utah. It's really quite extraordinary and frightening in many, many ways. My final point is that since we now have data protection in 90 countries, I think the takeaway point that I'm leaving with you is that we fought for what we have, and we have to keep fighting to protect privacy as a human right. Thanks for listening to me.